Pictures. I'll ask, uh, I'll ask uh, Mustafa. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, so hello everyone. Um, I'm honored and delighted to have to have the chance to introduce our next plenary speaker, Professor Sivina Monjo of the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign, where I was actually a couple of weeks ago for another conference, one on language acquisition, and I think and she was actually one of the organizers of that conference. So Professor Monjol is, you know, is one of the most leading names in the entire field of second language acquisition. And one of the most highly cited researchers in the field at the same time. She has a PhD in linguistics from the Department of Linguistics at McGill University, which is where I have my PhD from. And in fact, one of my co-advisors, Lydia White, is, was also her advisor. And, and when I was at McGill, her name and her achievements were always an inspiration for us, for, for the students at McGill. Um, actually, I don't know if she will remember, but this is not my first time hosting her. I actually hosted her also, half hosted her, also as a graduate student at McGill when we had a colloquium. And when I heard that the speaker was Sabina Monchol at that time, I immediately volunteered to be the graduate student host, which involved basically walking with her from one building. <laughs> <laughs> but still, it is called the graduate student host. So, <laughs> so I'm delighted today that I get to host her once again, and this time is a faculty member. <laughs> professor Monchol is currently a professor of linguistics as well as of Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese, and also second language acquisition and teacher education at the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign. She is also the director of several centers and is associated with various places, which I'm not going to count. Too many to count. She <laughs> specializes in the generative approaches to the second language acquisition, and her research interests include adult second language acquisition of syntax and morphology, as well as incomplete acquisition of language, heritage language learning, and also the acquisition of Spanish. She's an extremely productive author. <coughs> she has authored four single authored books, including the acquisition of heritage languages, which has just been published in 2016 through the Cambridge University Press, and Incomplete Acquisition in Bilingualism, which was published through John Benjamins, as well as editing several other books. She is also a superwoman <laughs> who, who published more than a hundred journal articles and book chapters, peer-reviewed journal articles and book chapters. So she's extremely productive in leading journals such as Language, Lingua, not anymore, of course, lingua, changed to glossa. <laughs> second language research, theoretical linguistics, the modern language journals, studies in second language acquisition, um, language learning, heritage language journal, and many others. 
She has also been serving as the editor of the journal Second Language Research, which is one of the leading journals in the field of second language acquisition. So if you submit a paper there, she will most likely be the, the one handling it, or not. Maybe it will be one of the associated with this. And she also serves in the editorial boards of many other journals, leading journals in the field. She is the recipient of numerous awards and honors for her research and teaching. In 2013, for example, she, she was named the University Scholar for the University of Illinois. She is also the recipient of many grants from several prestigious organizations, such as the National Science Foundation. And although she's, from, she's coming here from the University of Illinois, which is right next door, and we are lucky to invite her from such a close she's proximity, from, People often have to invite her across from continents. She is a very popular keynote speaker actually. So she has actually delivered several talks, several keynote and plenary talks in many different countries. In the last couple of years alone, for example, she has delivered plenary talks in countries like France, Germany, UK, Norway, Sweden, Japan, Portugal. Belgium and various other places also, also in North America, in many leading linguistics and language acquisition conferences. So it really is a great honor that she, she has accepted our invitation and we are delighted to host her today. Her talk is going to be on other, different, less common, distant languages and I know she doesn't like to use the term, is the term to be less than the third languages. And she will tell us why also, I think. And how these languages could inform theory and pedagogical practices in language acquisition. So please join me in welcoming Professor Monshok. Well, thank you, Honor. This was an honor to have you <laughs> talk so highly about me. And, um, and yes, I was invited two years ago, but I had another <laughs> commitment at that time. So I'm glad I was able to, do, to make it this time. Although, as you heard, I am known for my work on the acquisition of Spanish. And this same weekend is the Hispanic Linguistics Symposium at Georgetown, where we also have a paper. So but I chose to come here because I wanted to do something different. And maybe I have something to offer to you as well. So I'm very happy to be here and see my friends uh, in second language and uh, second language studies. Uh, so happy to see all of them here. So uh, I'm going to talk about, so the question you might have is what am I doing in this conference? Although uh, maybe <laughs> honor explain why I'm here. But um, since I'm mostly known for my research, what am I doing? I have a life in our science department. I have to explain why I'm here. Uh, uh, but um, uh, I also, uh, when I was a graduate student, I developed an interest in other languages because as a linguist, I think it's very important to learn about not only in your native languages, but in languages that you don't know. That's what linguists do, right? So I felt it was important for me to get out of my comfort zone. And I have continued to learn language, so let's see if I can do it. So I felt uh, okay, so um, I'm going to talk about language acquisition, and um, as you know, many linguistic theories of language and of language acquisition so, are predominantly um, based on I'm research going to talk about language acquisition, and, uh, and I'm talking about other languages uh, because uh, I want to talk about languages other than English on the same at the same time. There are other European languages that also study, like Spanish, is studied a lot. But still, I want to talk about say, uh, in comparison to English, it's not as much studied. I'm also going to talk about, I don't want to talk about uh, less commonly taught languages, because none of the languages I'm going to discuss today are less commonly taught. And also because this is a political term used in the United States for particular reasons. So, and, and these are terms that are relative. So a language that is less commonly taught in the United States is not necessarily a language that is less commonly taught in Germany 
or in the UK, because these are political, uh, geopolitical notions, so I, and I didn't want to just focus on those languages, okay? But I'm going to be talking a little bit about the context of the United States. Middle so, it's the middle one. The middle one? Okay. Oh, thank you. The purpose of this talk then is to show that the acquisition of other different, less common, distant languages is also constrained by the same mechanisms uh, and, uh, that undergo uh, and undergo the same processes attested in other languages. So whatever we have been able to uh, see in English, we would also see in other languages, and this helps us to advance. Uh, theory building, uh, expand our empirical research base, and ultimately, uh, because uh, many of you are engaged in teaching these languages, probably learn something about what these findings may mean for language, the teaching of these languages. Okay, I'm going to be talking about three instances of language acquisition. Uh, first language acquisition, but very briefly. But mostly, my work is on second language acquisition and heritage I'm language going to be talking acquisition. About three okay. So in order to discuss these acquisition situations, we need to define some of these terms. So uh, what we mean by uh, a first language versus a second language. This has to do with order of acquisition. The first language is the language acquired first at home um, in, in your family. Uh, and a second language is a language that you acquire after the, the st structural foundations of the first language are in place. Uh, but if you are uh, bilingual, then uh, we also need to take into account the functional dimension of language. So if you use two or more languages in daily life, uh, you will be using one more than the other for different reasons. So then we have a primary language and a secondary language. And finally, uh, this is relevant for heritage languages, um, is the socio-political dimension. So majority language is a language that is represented in society uh, uh, official languages of states, uh, official languages of the government, imparted in education, and protected. Uh, minority languages do not share the same status. It doesn't necessarily have any much to do with the number of speakers, or so in some instances it does, uh, but it is mostly the political status of the language. So to give an example, there are like nine million uh, speakers of Quechua in Peru, but still Quechua is a minority language with respect to Spanish, okay? Um, so, in language acquisition in general, uh, it, it's a process. There is a beginning, there is a middle, and there is an end. Uh, now, the beginning uh, is called the initial state, and here, depending on what type of learner you are, and I'm going to assume the theoretical position uh, that now, the beginning uh, I still, uh, is called the initial uh, state, sympathize with uh, the charity of projects, where we assume there is something called universal grammar, or a uh, language specific uh, construct that allows you to learn a language, but we also have general cognition. Okay, so a, a first language learner will start with these two uh, sources of knowledge. But if you are a second language learner or a bilingual, you're going to have also another language or languages. Okay, so how you start is important. Now. Uh, if you are interested in language teaching, this is the area where you know most teachers tend to focus on and what happens during development from the beginning to the middle. And here's what we see a lot of grammatical restructuring. Uh, in first language acquisition as well, children make errors. Uh, these are called developmental errors. I'll give you some examples. Uh, and then uh, second language learners and bilinguals also make errors that are related to uh, influence from the other language. Now, the end, the end state of acquisition is called end state or ultimate attainment. A monolingual child or a native speaker child will become a native speaker of language X, but we know that in second language acquisition and in bilingualism, native-like attainment is not necessarily guaranteed. It doesn't mean it can't happen, but it's not but very common for many reasons. Okay. So I'm going to be focusing on the intermediate stages because this is where all the fun goes on, with the, what, what, what the kind of restructuring that takes place. And as I said, there are at least two types of errors that uh, language learners make. Uh, developmental errors are errors made by all learners, first language learners, second language learners, bilingual. They are common to, if you are focusing on a particular language, let's say English, uh, all learners of English make those errors regardless of the native language. 
And uh, sometimes they make um, uh, errors that are not grammatical in their native language, not grammatical in the target language, but they are grammatical in another language. Um, and then we have transfer errors that are usually related to, uh, that happen in L2 acquisition and bilingualism, and they are traceable to the learners of bilinguals other language. Uh, examples of developmental errors in English, uh, uh, in, uh, regular morphology applied to irregular forms, or omission of inflectional morphology, okay? There are other examples from syntax in other languages, for example, again, a, in Spanish and in English as second languages um, with uh, complex WH movement or with relative clauses, many learners omit prepositions. Um, Hilton Stam uh, so, uh, saw that uh, learners of Swedish also use resumptive pronouns when asking questions and using relative clauses in Swedish. And uh, Schwartz and Sprouse talk about word order rules in an L1 Turkish of German that not come from German or Turkish. And another uh, <coughs> error that has been discussed in the literature is also in English. It's some Japanese learners of English exhibit WH scope marking, which is a way of making questions in English that is ungrammatical in English, ungrammatical in Japanese, but grammatical in German, okay? Um, transfer errors do not occur in the first language because you don't have another language to transfer. Uh, they are very common in earlier stages of second language development. And of course, here's what we see that speakers from different languages make different types of errors. And they happen at all levels of uh, linguistic structure, phonological, lexical, semantic, and syntactic levels, okay? Uh, so a theory that has, uh, is native of Indiana University, the full transfer full access hypothesis has been extremely influential in explaining uh, how language transfer operates in uh, second language acquisition. So assuming uh, the construct of universal grammar, which is a language, and also you have cognition, of course, uh, that's what the learner has uh, as a cognitive structure, but there's also a person. one learner, the L2, the L1 input will be filtered through this directly. And then throughout the process, the, uh, this is called the interlanguage in second language acquisition, the grammar grows uh, and it moves away in a way from the first language in its path to the, to the ultimate attainment of the second language but it is informed also by universal grammar along the way and that allows the learner to after a uh, period of uh, exposure to the second language to begin to leave behind second language acquisition. We know that uh, children acquire their L1, learned inflectional and derivational morphology of their language. And when we say acquisition of morphology, the the um, benchmark that has been used is usually speakers. And uh, recently, Slavakova 2008 advanced the hypothesis that when you look at all these areas of grammatical knowledge, Morphology seems to be the problem for second language learners. Not the syntax, not the morphology. And she calls that the bottleneck for second language acquisition. I didn't want to assume how the knowledge of people here, so I have to go a little bit <laughs> through uh, what is derivational and inflectional morphology, although uh, you never know who's in the audience. So, uh, derivational morphology has lexical information and it's used to derive new words. And for example, some languages have positive, positive morphemes, transitive item morphemes, and other word formation morphemes. And Turkish is a language that has lots of them, of course. Uh, functional morphology, this is very problematic in second language acquisition, interfaces with syntax, carries syntactic information, and is the locus of cross-linguistic variation. So according to some theoretical 
proposal that were syntax emerged from its projected from the lexicon. Okay. So what is a morpheme when well, we say that learners do not know the morphology of a language? We are talking about at least three types of information. So if you take an inflectional morphology that the plural S, it has a phono phonological forms, but it also has a meaning and it has a syntactic distribution. It attaches only to ends. An example of a derivation morphology is the causative Turkish der that also has uh, different phonological uh, forms. It has a meaning related to adding a logical subject and transitive verb. And the syntactic distribution is that it attaches to transitive and intransitive verbs. Okay? So when a learner not, is learning the morphology, they have to learn all these, these uh, uh, parts of a morphing the phonology, the lexical item, and the feature composition. And according to um, a recent theory of uh, what the problem is in second language composition, in particular with the morphology, is the feature reassembly hypothesis. Formal features, so we say that morphemes have formal features that include uh, uh, morphology, uh, syntactic and semantic information. And these are mapped onto a piece of lexical, a, a lexical item. And the, pro the problem is that different languages might have the same morphemes, but they have different information. Mm -hmm. And what learners have to do is to rearrange all these bundles of features with lexical items, okay? So assembling the particular lexical, lexical items of a second language requires that the learner reconfigure features from the way these are represented in DL1 into new formal configurations on possibly quite different types of lexical items in DL2. So learning lexical items with bundles of features in, in new configurations appears to be the most important learning task. And that's an explanation of why uh, we find so, my, so many problems with morphology. So I'm going to give some examples. So is there L1 influence in morphology? To what extent the uh, configurations of features in the L1 uh, uh, influence the L2? <coughs> And uh, in order to answer this question, we need to look at morphologically different languages. And uh, languages that seem to behave syntactically similarly, but have different morphological realizations of a so given phenomenon. So this is what I did in my dissertation 20 years ago. I, okay, I was uh, a student at McGill, as Werner said, and I remember going to Lydia White and, and saying, I, I'm teaching Spanish, so I want to do a dissertation on Spanish. And she looked at me and said, that's not how we choose dissertation topics. No, it has to be, it has to be driven by a theoretical question. Oh, but I have these learners of Spanish. I just want to do No, that's how, not, not how we choose a topic. So, um, of course, that's stuck, right? And I was looking, uh, looking for a topic or a dissertation topic. I ran into this phenomenon, the, the fact that you have transitivity alternations in English. You have verbs like that change, that can be transitive or, or intransitive, like the key broke, the window, or the window broke. And then you have non-alternative verbs, like Julia cut the branch, the branch cut. And it hasn't been observed in L1 acquisition of English that children, yeah, monolingual children, sorry. Um, okay, before going to that. You have intransitive verbs that cannot do that. Some of them can, but others can. So the verb disappear cannot appear in a transitive configuration. You need to put it for it. And it hasn't been observed in L1 acquisition of English that children, Okay, so you need to uh, you need to add make to make it transitive. Okay, and the same with an ergative verbs. Peter laughed. The clown laughed. Peter is ungrammatical. The clown made Peter laugh. Okay, uh, so in the one children make errors of using these verbs incorrectly. Transitive. Uh, and one explanation was that, well, it has to do with the morphology of English. It doesn't have any morphology. So any verb can do from whatever they want. You can, you know, put it in a transitive framework or an intransitive framework. So then, of course, I, I speak Spanish and I say, but in Spanish, you do this. If, when you have an intransitive form, you have to add this morpheme, se. So you can say, la mujer cocinó la sopa, the woman cooked the soup, and la sopa se cocinó. So here now you have to add the morpheme. Say, which is an intransitive morpheme. 
Okay, so it, Spanish marks this alternation on the intransitive. Okay, so here's my theoretical problem. I need a language that will do this on the other side, on the causative. That's how I run into Turkish. Okay, so for I needed to complete my typology for my dissertation, and so I wanted to study acquisition of English, the acquisition of Spanish, and why not the acquisition of Turkish? That's why I'm in this conference now. Okay, so um, Turkish is like Spanish with some verbs. So the intransitive form has the morphing L. Okay, <coughs> this one. But it also has the causative pattern, which is what I was looking for. The ear morphing. Okay, so some verbs go one, one way, some verbs go another way. So uh, that's why I, this was part of my dissertation work, which was a tri directional study of English as a second language, Turkish as a second language, and Spanish as a second language by speakers of the same languages. Okay? And I wanted to see whether the, this second language has also awesome red transitivity like errors like has been found in L1 acquisition, and whether the morphology of the language would help them figure it out. Okay? And I use the same methodology. Okay, so of course I assumed the full transfer full access hypothesis at that time, which indicated that everything was going to transfer, both the, the argument structure and the morphological uh, patterns. Um, but uh, at the same time, that would predict that since the languages worked uh, the same at the level of argument structure, that should not be a problem. The only problem should be the morphology, okay? But what I found was they were still making transitivity alternations, like children have been found to do in English, but at the same time, the morphology was predictive of what was going to happen. So we found developmental errors like in L1 acquisition and errors with the morphology. So for example, the Spanish speakers learning Turkish were of course very good with the verbs in Turkish that have the L morphing. Uh, and the Turkish speakers learning Spanish were also very good with Spanish uh, because of the same uh, morphing. And of course, the English speakers were the ones that had more trouble figuring out the morphology in Turkish, okay? So uh, it looked like to some extent, although you cannot transfer absolutely everything in the morphology, there were some patterns that were, of course, traceable to the learners and what. Okay, so that was my dissertation. Now I'm interested, I have been studying case systems, okay? So languages also vary with respect to how they express case morphologically or, or, and syntactically. Today I'm only going to talk about the morphological expression of case, okay? So we have as, uh, the same as with uh, transitive and intransitive morphemes, we have languages that have no overt case marking or very poor case marking, and then languages that have a lot of case marking like Turkish versus Hindi and English. And then also languages vary with respect to how many cases they have. So uh, for example, Spanish has uh, two or three cases uh, that are morphologically expressed, but Russia has, has over six, marking, okay? Very and then there's another problem. So some language, this has to do with case systems. So some languages have the nominative accusative and pattern, and others have the ergative pattern. Uh, which so, uses a different uh, case for subjects of uh, intransitive, uh, of transitive uh, verbs, okay? So, like Hindi, Bas, Indo, Tito, Diyazas, Mayan languages, and other topics, okay? And a, a topic I've been uh, studying uh, a lot in the last 10 years is differential object marking. Again, this is a phenomenon that I found in Spanish, and I, was, I continue to be puzz puzzled by why it's so difficult for second language learners and heritage speakers, and that has taken me to all languages of the world. That's why I want to show you about that, okay? So this phenomenon, it's a widespread phenomenon in languages of the world. Some direct objects are marked with overt morphology, and the objects that are marked are more semantically or pragmatically salient than non-marked objects. So in Spanish, uh, this is done with the preposition a. Uh, so you have to say Marcos vio a Lucrecia. Mm -hmm. To say Marcos saw Lucrecia, you need that preposition. If if your marked, object is animate and specific, you need to have that preposition. But if the object is inanimate, you do not have to have that preposition. 
okay? In general, the general, okay, okay. Romanian is like Spanish. Romanian is a Romance language. Uh, and I have to say that Spanish and Romanian are the only Romance languages that have this phenomenon, okay? Uh, it, it, it doesn't exist in Portuguese, in Italian, or in uh, French. Uh, so, in, in Romanian is like Spanish, in, except that the preposition is pe. Marcos a de Lucrecia, or Marcos a casa. So, one is anime, you need that preposition pe. Okay? So, the generalization in these two languages is that if the object is anime and specific, it has to be marked with a or pe, depending on the language. If you are uh, not this type of object, then there's a lot of semantics going on here. This is a very complex topic. I'm not going to go into all the details, but there's a lot of semantics and pragmatics with all this. Okay? But this is categorical. This is categorical. And I'm going to be focusing on that. Hindi uh, also has uh, the same phenomenon, uh, but uh, direct objects are obligatory marked with the postposition ko if they are animate and specific. However, they are also marked if they are inanimate. Uh, you have to be specific, specific in, in Hindi. In animacy is not relevant. Same as Turkish. Turkish accusative marking in Turkish uh, is a marker of specificity. So if the object is animate and specific, you need to mark it with E. Uh, and uh, if it is uh, inanimate and specific, you also mark it with E. Be whatever. Uh, the vowel so the generalization for Turkish and Hindi is that uh, the marker, the accusative marker with objects is obligatory when the object is specific. Okay? So there are similarities between Spanish and Hindi is in the sense that both Spanish and Hindi use the same marker that it's used for also indirect objects and dative subjects. So a is used in uh, indirect objects and native subjects in Spanish, and in Hindi, ko is also used for indirect objects and native subjects. And there are also similarities between Hindi and Turkish, uh, because these two languages do not have um, determiners. So they have a numeral, ek and bil, uh, but it looks like that's why this accusative case has to mark specificity. Okay, and they also use word order for this as well. Now, Persian is also a language that has DOM, and it is marked with ra in Persian. Okay, and in Persian, definiteness and specificity seem to outrank animacy. Okay. Uh, also, now the difference between Hindi and Spanish is that ra is not the same that you. And um, they have the marker ya or a that is used for both indirect objects and um, the, the accusative uh, objects. Okay? Okay, and then I mentioned Hindi and Balochi are also similar because they are ergative languages. So you have this marker DOM, the DOM marker, only when it is a, a transitive. Um, perfective, uh, perfect. Uh, no, sorry. In Balochi, is present tense and most often animate specific direct objects. In um, in uh, Hindi, is perfective. Uh, you have to be a perfective predicate. Okay. So these are the uh, markers in Persian and Balochi, and the formal semantic features that they encode. Okay. So in Balochi is more complex because it's also related to uh, the perfectivity of the um, predicate. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how this phenomenon is acquired by monolingual children. And there are only two studies I was able to find. One is by Rodriguez Montañero, who was a professor here, 
and he has the study of uh, Spanish-speaking children using the Childless database. And what he found is that three-year-old children produce But four-year-old children already produce Ra with 97% uh, accuracy, range between 82 and 100%, okay? So, I mean, there's only two studies, okay? I mean, that's not much. But let's suppose this is on the right track. Well, it looks like this DOM is not very problematic for very young children. But that's not the situation in second language acquisition. Okay, as I told you before, I started, I became interested in this topic because I saw it a lot in Spanish as a second language. And there are several studies that show this with uh, students at different levels of proficiency that do not uh, seem to know about when to use. Uh, accusative marking with specific objects. And there's another uh, recent study by, uh, not also L2 Turkish, by Greek learners, Papadopoulou uh, et al. 2010. speakers because Turkish and Romanian uh, have this phenomenon although Romanian is like Spanish in the feature specification of the, of the marker and Turkish is a little bit different but still uh, has it. So these are Turkish learners of Spanish and um, we have two proficiency that this is something uh, a study I did with Ayşe Gürel. We had uh, this means this is the rating of ungrammatical sentences without the marking in Spanish. These are the native speakers. We see that the Turkish speakers are a little bit more accepting of this phenomenon, but compared to English speakers who are about here, they are much better, okay? Uh, now, remember that in Turkish, uh, the phenomenon also applies to inanimate objects, but in Spanish, it doesn't. So here you see with inanimate objects, that the Turkish speakers do think that you also need that marker with inanimate objects. Whereas uh, at, at higher levels of proficiency, they start to figure out that maybe that's not the case. I do have to say though, that this is a, in what we are seeing in Spanish dialects is that the marker is extended to inanimates in native speakers. That's why you see this high rating by native speakers. And you're going to see it more clearly here when I show you the Romanian learners of Spanish who were, even at intermediate levels of proficiency, they were native-like already in Spanish. I heard that they watch lots of soap operas. That's why they are so good uh, at Spanish. But they, we, we went to look for intermediate level learners and they were already extremely proficient uh, when we tested them. So as you can see here, no difference between the, the, the Romanian learners of Spanish and the Spanish native speakers, and here, to show you that the Romanian speakers are even better than the native speakers, because this is a tendency that we're seeing in, in, in some monolingual varieties of Spanish, that the marking is extended to inanimates, but the Romanians don't know that. Okay? But they sh that's fine, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. 
Okay, and then there's a study of Balochi learners of Persian. Um, so as I said before, there are some similarities and differences between ba Balochi and Persian. Uh, and there's also evidence that the object, mar object marking is a particularly problematic area of Balochi learners of Persian. And this is a study of Bonaker and Mohammadi, 2012. Uh, it's a study of Balochi speaking children between the ages of seven and 11, receiving schooling in Persian. And uh, they looked at written comp compositions. And these are, um, these are looking at indirect object markings. Remember that there's be and ra, but the children are using ra instead of be, the second, uh, the second graders, because in Balochi you use the same marker for indirect and direct object. And then by the following grade, they are, they are getting better, okay? Um, and this is differential object marking, and you can also see here that uh, the second graders are also omitting a lot of the marker or um, uh, are not using uh, ra that much. But then b by the third grade, they uh, use ra, but they also use zero a lot. So they're still having difficulties with uh, ra in the third grade, okay? So there are 68% of indirect objects are marked with ra instead of be in, in, by the Balochi children. And there's significant omission of RA with the direct objects, even at the third uh, grade level, okay? So we can say that in some languages, you can see how, how close or far away the languages are in terms of what the feature specifications that they have. They, the acquisition of this phenomenon could be a little bit easier or more difficult, okay? And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about heritage languages. So uh, there's also, this is a study to be compared with the Rodriguez Montañedo study in Spanish. Uh, so these are bilingual children before the ages of three. Remember that Mondo, the Rodriguez Montañedo found that monolingual children knew this phenomenon at 98% accuracy by age three. Well, that's not the case of bilingual children. They have 70 almost 75% of omission. Uh, so that means that this, not, this is not acquired very early uh, in bilingual children, okay? And then, of course, I have done many studies of adult heritage speakers and also children, uh, but older children, okay? And in this study of, or, uh, of children, I have oral narratives in Spanish, and the children are omitting a lot of this um, marker in Spanish compared to uh, monolingual children from Mexico. And here are individual results. These dots mean children. So these are the native speakers in Mexico, the children. And in the heritage speakers, we have some that are as good as the native speakers, but others who did not produce the marker at all. And then you see a lot of variability, okay? Uh, but you, when you compare children, uh, adult, with adult heritage speakers, the adults are a little bit better, but still non-native like. They get a little bit better, but they still, the problem remains. So I was, again, why I was uh, very puzzled by this phenomenon, why is DOM omitted in Spanish by Spanish heritage speakers? Is it related to the way the marker is, uh, uh, exhi I mean, in Spanish, we only have this A uh, that is not very acoustically salient. So, uh, at the same time, if you don't, it's only a, a question of uh, being acoustically salient. This remember that this marker is also the marker of indirect objects and native subjects. So, you know, it, it cannot be just a phonological problem. But it, just to test that, I also, I have been involved with this large study in the, in the last few years. Um, uh, together with two colleagues, Sene Vinoa, Rakesh Bhatt, and Roxana Girshu, we looked at uh, Spanish, Hindi, and Romanian as heritage languages in the United States. Uh, we had uh, uh, heritage speakers that were simultaneous bilinguals, others that were sequential bilinguals, and then we also tested native speakers in Mexico and adult immigrants here of the same languages and different age groups, okay? And here we were contrasting the markers. Remember that these three languages are very similar, but the acoustic salience of the markers are different. And here to show you these are grammaticality ratings that these are the native speakers from Mexico. So they reject 
sentences without like Juan Bio Maria, this is a grammatical, and they reject those sentences, but the bilingual groups in the United States don't that much. Okay? Um, and then we looked at where they omit a uh, with uh, indirect objects, and you can see that there's a difference between omission with direct objects, indirect objects, and dative experiences, showing that this cannot just be a phonological problem. Okay? Uh, we also looked at Hindi, and we had only one group of heritage speakers, and there's a, these are uh, Hindi speakers in India and uh, Hindi speakers in the United States, first generation, and they are the ones, the Hindi heritage speakers are the ones who are accepting the sentences. The other three groups are not. And also when we looked at the three uh, contexts, uh, uh, direct objects, indirect objects, and native subjects, the problem is mostly with in the, uh, the direct objects and dative subjects, okay? Not with indirect objects. And Romanian, same thing. We had two groups of heritage speakers, two groups of Romanians in Romania, one group of Romanians in the United States. They do not like sentences with no pay, but the heritage speakers are accepting sentences with no pay, okay? And here's, again, the in the Romanians, we can also see that most of the omission, acceptance of ungrammatical omissions, are with animate direct objects, and much less with when pe is a locative, for example, okay, or uh, other uses of indirect objects, okay. So when I compare, we compare Spanish, Hindi, and Romanian, we see that the heritage speakers omit this marker in the three languages, but there's more significantly more omission in Spanish. Uh, than in the two languages, and even it has affected the first generation of immigrants as well. This is another talk. I'm not going to tell you, you can ask me about this, but uh, that's not what I wanted to uh, focus on today. I can tell you what, what else is going on. Finally, uh, heritage languages and second languages. If you are teaching a less commonly taught language or, or many of these other languages, you will find that many of your speakers, your students, are heritage speakers and they have to be in the classroom with second language learners. And one of the big questions we have is, how similar and different are these speakers? On the one hand, they have, they got, they have different upbringing, but in terms of grammatical development, are they similar, are they different? And that's why we also need to make, uh, to do studies comparing these two groups. So here again, we looked at a morphological uh, case in Turkish, uh, sorry, in Hindi, and we have nominative is zero, ne is the ergative, and then ko has the multiple realizations. Again, accusative, dative, and dative of uh, uh, experience or subjects. And we had uh, participants who are the same heritage speakers I showed you earlier, and then we had a group of 24 L2 learners of Hindi that we tested in Illinois, okay, taking Hindi. So the difference between the heritage speakers and the L2 learners is that the heritage speakers were uninstructed. So these were not heritage speakers taking Hindi, but the L2 learners were students of Hindi. Okay? And when we did a well, we did a proficiency test, but we also asked them to celebrate their skills in Hindi and English, and you can see that the Hindi, the heritage speakers and the L2 learners celebrate their Hindi similarly, even though they have different backgrounds. And then we looked on many things, but when you look at accuracy on home market in oral production, we see that the two groups are extremely similar, okay? Different from the native speakers. Okay, so uh, morphological variability is observed in L2 learners and heritage speakers, do not occur in L1 acquisition, and and this is this phenomenon that I, I showed you. It seems to be constrained by semantic and syntactic complexity and the distribution of reliability of these case markers in the input. Okay. There is L1 influence in how uh, the learners perceive this morpheme, uh, but that's not the only explanation, I think, for why uh, we see the patterns that we have. And of, I think these findings are compatible with the feature reassembly hypothesis, but also there are other things going on. So what accounts for difficulty uh, with the morphology at these stages? 
Well, DOM in general, we have languages that have DOM and that languages that don't. And in general, it seems to be a complexity of the grammar because you are basically selecting a group of objects that have particular properties and marking them. And we know uh, that in general, more marked complex structures are associated with uh, a cluster of properties. Uh, as we see, that the mapping of form to meaning is non-transparent because sometimes the same form can have multiple meanings. So there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Also, if some objects are marked and others are not, the issue of frequency comes, uh, comes uh, to mind because indirect objects, for example, are always marked. It doesn't matter if you're specific or non-specific or animate or inanimate. But for these direct objects, it matters. So difficulty and complexity play a role for the acquisition of morphology in English. We know that. But it also plays a role for the acquisition of, of these other languages. Okay? There's another possibility to account for this phenomenon, which uh, has also been theorized under the interface hypothesis. This hypothesis was put forth by Sorachi many years ago. The latest incarnation is 2011. And she claimed that the syntax semantics interface is not problematic, but the syntax pragmatics interface is problematic for second language learners and bilinguals. Well, um, under the reasons why this interface, and when she was looking at the syntax pragmatics interface, she offer, always refers to the realization of overt subjects in null subject languages. Okay? Um, well, uh, there's cross-linguistic influence in representation or parsing. There are also processing limitations because bilinguals and second language learners uh, need to coordinate several sources of information, uh, especially when they speak and when they process the language. But also the quality and the quantity of input received in bilingual grammars play, play a role. And bilingualism per se, which is executive control of two languages in real time. But I have argued also that DOM is an interface phenomenon. It's an interface between morphology, syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. Because I haven't shown you all the complexities of this phenomenon, but it is uh, it's subject to many of these parameters. Okay? Okay, so the phenomenon itself is complex. And then this other crucial difference between the three learning scenarios that I showed you is that. First language learners and heritage speakers share many characteristics with respect to when they receive input in childhood, early in a naturalistic setting, and predominantly through auditory medium. And they differ from second language learners because second language learners come, start to learn a second language late. They are usually instructed. That, that, that means that the input is already different, and the processing mechanisms are different. And they receive written and uh, oral language. But where the second language learners and uh, heritage speakers are similar is in the fact that they didn't receive enough input, right? So first language learners receive abundant input and frequent input, and that input is rich and varied because they use the language in multiple contexts. By contrast, heritage speakers, uh, especially after they start school in the majority language, there's a significant reduction of exposure and use of the heritage language. And then the context of use is very restricted to the home or some family members or church, but very restricted. So they don't have a huge range. And they don't read in the heritage language. Therefore, it's the, the, the context is restricted. The input is restricted. And the same happens with the two learners. They are receiving one, two, three, four, five hours of instruction a day, a week, sorry. And, you know, they are reading, it, it's limited to what the exposure that they receive in the classroom in many cases. Mm -hmm. So I, we can see that the input must be also playing a role in the acquisition of this phenomenon. So amount of input and frequency is crucial for the acquisition of inflectional and derivational morphology. L2 learners and heritage speakers are exposed to much less input than child L1 learners, and this impedes their mastery of the morphology of the target language at native levels. And William O'Grady, who uh, has also worked a lot on heritage languages and in first language acquisition, and is taking uh, a 
present a more emergentist account of language acquisition. And he claims that grammar is processing state. So he talks about the processor as being grammar, has a major role to play in computing for meaning associations, assumptions of both generative and emergentist frameworks. And input-related factors like salience, frequency, and transparency facilitate the establishment and strengthening of four meaning mappings at the word and morphing levels. And this is what he says, the four meaning mappings that have proven most acceptable to partial acquisition and attrition are those for which the four meaning mapping is likely to be problematic to the processor, either because the form's phonetic profile is acoustically compromised or because its precise semantic function is difficult to discern. And such mappings are acquired only with the help of high frequency instantiations in the input, a condition that is not often met in second language acquisition and heritage language acquisition. So to conclude, the acquisition of other languages in many ways is not different from the acquisition of English. The same theories that have been advanced on the basis of English apply to the acquisition of other languages. Uh, also, morphological complexity of other languages does not necessarily translate in an, into other languages being more difficult to acquire than English, for example. All languages, regardless, especially if you are a first language learner, present the same level of difficulty for the learner. They are, um, they are um, a chronological development of specific structures. Again, the complexity of the language would determine whether a given feature is acquired, takes longer to be acquired. Let's take the case of plurals in Arabic that are very complex. So an Arabic speaking child takes eight, is about eight years of age by the time they control the, the, all the plural forms, whereas an English speaking child by age three is fine because the, the system of plurals in, in Arabic is constrained, is complex. But that, if it is complex for, complex for the child, it's also going to be complex for the adult, okay? So no language is more difficult than the other in general. There are complexities within each language, okay? Uh, and the same processes that have been identified in language, in language acquisition of English and European languages are at play in the acquisition of other languages. And we also need, we also need to do research in other languages to advance our current theoretical understanding of the languages and of language acquisition in different situations. And of course, hopefully we'll, this will also make contributions to the teaching of these languages because we need to understand the developmental schedules of these languages in a monolingual situation. The challenge that we have is that we don't have enough studies of the L1 acquisition of these languages, which this makes it difficult to understand what the schedules should be like in second language acquisition and bilingual acquisition. Um, okay, and also we don't have data on ultimate attainment of these other languages because not, we don't, and it would be interesting to see this, then we can compare whether these languages are more difficult to acquire than a language like English. What does the end state of these languages look like? But we don't have that data, okay? So finally, uh, research on and learning other languages promote dissemination of knowledge of the languages more uh, widely, preservation and enhancement of linguistic diversity, foster greater linguistic, linguistic, cultural, and political understanding. But of course, much more needs to be done to understand the good of the development of these languages. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great talk. We have quite some time for questions. Um, thank you very much for this interesting talk. In, your, in the study with Hindi, Romanian, and Spanish, so these core P and A, you, you term this um, differential object learning. Okay. So in, um, and you mentioned that this interacts with the animacy hierarchy, right? Yes. So, okay. Did you, so you looked at basically Grammaticality judgment? No. no? Okay. This is a huge project funded by the National Science Foundation. We have six tasks. Okay? We have oral production, uh, written production, oral comprehension, written comprehension, and grammatical judgment. Okay, task. so in the grammatical judgment task, basically you looked at omission, right? So the presence yes. of the marking and then omission. Did you look at any cases where it's actually ungrammatical to 
put these uh, morphemes overtly yes, in there. Okay. And, so, and yes. also the interaction with animacy. Yes. Did you check that? So this ta the grammatical judgment task in these languages was like 128 sentences for Spanish and Romanian and 145 for Hindi. In Hindi, we also looked at ergativity and in Romanian and Spanish at clitic doubling because this phenomenon uh, interacts with clitic doubling. And we had indirect objects, uh, locatives, native subjects, and we control for animacy. So we had, uh, the design was such, you would have the marker um, in all these co configurations. So I sh just showed you the very basic. So I was just w wondering whether they actually agreed with the native speakers in their judgment on these overtly marked DOMs. No. no, they no. also differed. Not the, the heritage speakers. Not the heritage speakers. I mean, you speakers. have, again, I showed you group results. Yeah. Uh, then that's why we did the individual analysis. And when I, you saw this table where I said percentage of people who are omitting the marker uh, consistently. And we found 30% of the heritage speakers, Hindi heritage speakers, 30% of the Romanian heritage speakers were consistent omitters. The other ones were fine, okay? But in Spanish, we found that 60% of the, of the participants were consistent omitters. And 30% of the adult immigrants, the parental generation, were, were uh, consistent omitters. So there's a lot of variability uh, by, by individual and within the system. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next. I also have production data. Yeah. And well, th thank you very much for the for the uh, very stimulating uh, talk. I actually wanted to ask you something that you might not be expecting me to ask you, which is okay. which is this: at the very beginning, uh, you expressed your hesitation mm -hmm. about the term "less commonly taught language," mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could l let me in on why you find this a um, uh, uh, not your not the way you'd like to to talk about. Because if I had pitched my talk about less commonly taught languages, I, I wouldn't be able to talk about Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to talk about Balochi, uh, because these are languages that the United States considers critical for uh, their security. So I think today the less commonly taught languages are, are Russian, Korean, uh, Farsi, uh, Turkish, uh, Hindi, but there are six. Uh, if you go to the you know, United States uh, Department of, uh, uh, not only education, no, but, but, but so then it, it will leave out other languages. And my point was that I, I mean, I happen to be interested in these languages which happen to be less commonly taught languages, but there are other languages that are not commonly taught that are also different, and also there are, as I said, Dutch, maybe here in Indiana, it's it's taught, but it's not, it's also a less commonly taught language, but it's not a critical language. Finnish is a less commonly taught language, but it's not a critical language for the United States. That's why it's a term that it's, it, it, it changes by country. So for, I don't know, for, for other countries, they, they have their, Languages. Use the microphone so that the people. Oh, I thought it was. Oh, the microphone over there. Okay, so that's that's why. I mean, um, it's complex. The same as heritage language. There are people who think. I mean, Joshua Fishman said, in the, the the definition of majority and minority is crucial for a heritage language. So some people think that English cannot be a heritage language. Well, that's false. English is a heritage language in every other part of the world. It means it's, it's a language not represented, uh, as I said, in, in, in the government, in, in not the language of schooling, but it has, it's a high status language, but still can be acquired as a heritage language. And it is acquired as a heritage language by many children. That, so then you get into these, you know, uh, uh, these uh, controversial 
definitions. And I, I just wanted to focus on the linguistics. <laughs> Well, because one challenge for second language acquisition researchers can be that in either in general or any particular context, it's very, very difficult to find learners of particular languages who are actually or adult learners who are actually acquiring those languages really as second languages oh, yes. and not. So even where we have you know, we have students acquiring at and sometimes at very advanced levels, Uzbek and Kazakh mm -hmm. and so on and so on here, but very seldom is that in fact their first foray yes. in acquiring a second language. And actually, yes, I didn't talk. I did. I my 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 presentation was going to be even more complex if I had talked about L3 acquisition or L LN acquisition, which is the case of these languages especially if they are being acquired as a second language. So this study on, by Papadoulou, Papadopoulou on uh, Greeks learning Turkish. I'm sure that those Greeks know English as well. So Turkish is not the L2, it's going to be an L3. Um, so I didn't want to uh, talk about this, but that, that's another dimension of, of the problem. But we also know, the little we know about L3 acquisition is that eventually it helps you. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at the beginning it's a little bit confusing, but then uh, you know, research done with monolinguals versus bilinguals learning another language, the bilinguals do better than the monolinguals in the long run. So the, the work of Elaine Klein, the one on the null prep, actually was a, a study that included one of the first studies on L3 acquisition. And she found that the bilinguals, the multi, she calls them the multilinguals, uh, you know, overcame those uh, interlanguage properties uh, faster than the bilinguals, the, the other ones who knew, for, for whom English was the second language. Oh, and another thing related to this, in my study of Romanian, Hindi, and Spanish, okay, there are many reasons why Spanish is behaving badly here. But another difference between these populations is that the Hindi speakers are multilingual. So uh, they, all of them spoke English at the same level as Hindi, plus as another South Asian language. And the Romanians were multilingual, all of them knew or French or German or Italian and English mm -hmm. in addition to Romanian. So uh, so what we saw in this study is that the first generation in Spanish is affected but the first generation in Hindi and Romanian is not affected. And there's more use of Spanish in the United States than use of Romanian and Hindi. So another potential explanation could be that attrition could affect more. Uh, the less languages you know, you know, could also be related to whether you, how much you are tried or not. So. Questions? Can I <coughs> so, uh, first, I wanted to ask: Your uh, study does not only involve uh, monolingual and bilinguals. It also includes people who learn languages in classes. Is that true? In classes? In classes, like for example. Well, yeah. Uh, so, um, if you look at uh, Sekbao, I have never studied the acquisition of a second language in a naturalistic setting. But uh, heritage language acquisition can happen in the wild and in the classroom, as Masha Polinsky and uh, Ola King and have, have put it. So, my Hindi heritage speakers were in the wild, meaning they are not taking classes. They are not heritage language learners. So we reserve the, ter the term heritage language learner for those heritage speakers who are being instructed. <coughs> so not all heritage speakers are heritage language learners. But uh, usually these people who were taking Hindi were interested in, in Hindi or were married to a a uh, Hindi speaking person, or they had friends, uh, but they were in the classroom. Because, as far as the instruction, for, especially for this direct object marking, is concerned, because there is not a good description, linguistic description, mm -hmm. of when we have this 
direct object marker. For example, I'm a native speaker of Persian, and I know where to use these and where not to use that. But when I want to instruct other students mm -hmm. about this, because there is not a good description, I myself is confused. So for example, I tell them, please overproduce this direct uh -huh. object marker, because it sounds much worse when you don't have it than I do. You are also introducing errors. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because I noticed that when they omit that, it sounds worse. Yeah. But when they have it, they overproduce it, it sounds less worse. So mm -hmm. that's what I instruct them to do. Now, if you look at the students from our class, then they overproduce this mm -hmm. because of the instruction that they receive. Yeah, I didn't discuss this, but another uh, source of error in second language acquisition is actually induced by the instruction, as you, as you correctly <laughs> pointed out. Uh, you know, this, there's a lot of interest uh, in this topic for some reason, and uh, there's actually a, a workshop uh, that I'm going to attend in, in Paris in, uh, in December, just on DOM. Um, um, and there are people who are looking at this phenomenon from a diachronic perspective and all kinds of perspectives. And we don't understand it. I mean, it's a very complex phenomenon. All we know is that in some cases it's very obligatory, as you just said. And then the other cases are, it depends on the pragmatics. It depends on the uh, you know, nuances of, of the situation. So uh, you can omit it, or you can have it. So animals, let's take animals. Uh, it's wishy-washy with animals. If the animal is big and prominent, and there are hierarchies, a lion will be marked, but a mosquito will not be marked. So uh, it has to do with all these kinds of prominence hierarchies. Another thing I did not control in this study, but I'm doing in another study, is looking at the, uh, the uh, it's called the prominent scale, definite scale. So pronouns can mark names, definite NPs, then you have indefinite NPs are not marked. or And, and so there's, there's this scale. And diachronically, this phenomenon has moved along this definite scale. But quantifiers in Spanish are all marked, regardless of whether they are specific or not specific, which are, they are not specific, of course. But, so it's, it's complex. Maybe one final question. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. a very interesting talk. Uh, my question is about the differential object marking again. Um, my, uh, in, um, the book by Nikolaeva and the Limpel mm -hmm. concentrate on differential object marking specifically, and of course they link it in a lot of languages, and I think in Hindu as well. Um, possibly, I can't remember exactly whether it was the case with information structural mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. prominence, etc. Yes. Did you include that into your studies? No, and not how in my studies that? because well, the problem is that I see it in the most obvious case. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so what is your, sorry? What is your name? Nargis. 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 Okay, like Nargis said, yeah. in some cases you have to have it or yeah. else the sentence is horrible. It's yeah. like a gender error. Wow, horrible. Yeah. Okay, so I have seen that the problem, the problem is in, in the most clear cases. Mm -hmm. Then the other cases are wishy-washy. Now I would use, the, I would look at the, uh, the other cases with near native speakers to see the people who already control the, the central use of this phenomenon, what, what do they do when you start playing with information structure? Um, but I've, one of my graduate students actually uh, she recently, did, so this is one of her qualifying papers where she used a different word order in Spanish and she's doing an eye tracking experiment. And she noticed that very advanced creative speakers do not process the marker in SVO sentences, but the minute you do different word order, oh, they have it. So topicalizations yeah. seem to pres are preserving the marker. In so now we're moving with heritage speakers. Now let's move to this phenomenon to see if they preserve it there. So this is just very fresh out of the eye tracker this week. <laughs> <laughs> very fresh data. But that's re that's encouraging. Yeah. yeah. At least there. So now we need to see uh, what's the system behind this omission. It's not random. There has to be a system that they are following. Yeah. So, thank you. I could. Maybe one. I would say that uh, heritage language speakers in the wilds 
must be really rare in the world because English is being taught everywhere. You mean for the speakers of English? Of English. Oh, yes, but not of other languages. No, but yeah. you said that yeah. English is not like that, but in fact right now, everybody wants to learn English in the whole world. Yes. So that's not really a heritage language anymore in the strict sense anywhere. Uh, well, it is a heritage language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, but not purely. But, but it, it's, it's also a prestige language. Well, the same can be said about Spanish in the United States. It has dual status. It is a heritage language, but it's also the most popular second or foreign language that's being uh, studied in this country. So some languages enjoy this double status. Yeah, but English is really a very special, special status in the whole world. More, much more than Chinese. <laughs> I still have data to show that uh, some learners of English who are here, the speakers of English, do not do uh, regular verbs or have problems with the double object construction or, you know. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome.